All right, it's time to talk with our featured guest, Dr. Brittany Dickinson. Brittany, how's it going? It's going great. Happy for it. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on and being available. If you can, give us a little bit more insight on you. Can you kick things off by telling us a bit about your practice, who you're serving, and what are some of the unique things you're doing for your patients? Absolutely. So I am approaching year four of practice ownership. I did an acquisition back in 2020, and I am a completely fee-for-service office in downtown Chicago. And what I focus on is cosmetics. So I own both my dental practice. And then I also did a startup injectables boutique on the side. So I own a couple of businesses, all mostly serving, making people feel and look great. Wow. Okay. So if we rewind a little bit, you're in year four in an acquisition. Mm -hmm. Did you feel like I like this spot, Chicago, I want to work here, I want to be here. Or were you more like, hey, this just came out of nowhere, this opportunity to be here in Chicago? No, Chicago was definitely a choice. So I grew up down in Florida, just outside of Miami, and I did all of my education down there. And I had lived in London for a little bit in school, knew I wanted a bigger city, more of like a northern city type of feel. So I methodically looked at so many cities in the U.S., like New York, Boston, Chicago, LA, and San Francisco. And Chicago just felt like home. It was definitely a feeling like it ticked all the boxes of the things that I wanted, but mostly it was that I was having really genuine connections with people when I was here. Midwesterners, if you know them, they feel very warm, very genuine. And I really liked that. And I think it helps that my mom's side of the family had lived in the Midwest. So immediately just felt like home to me. So when I finished school, the job that I thought I had fell through three days before I was supposed to move. And I had met a friend at a friend's wedding like the week prior, and he was moving here for his medical residency. And we were texting. I was like, this job fell through. I'm not really sure what to do. He's like, no problem. Allie vouched for you. Come sleep on my couch. You'll figure it out. And I'm like, okay. So, I mean, it could have gone badly. Either one of us could have been a psychopath, but he was very trusting. And our mutual friend is a very solid person. So I trusted her opinion and it did. It worked. I came up here within three days. I had found two jobs and an apartment that's going to definitely date me, but on Craigslist, I found a Craigslist roommate for three months for a furnished apartment. And I just thought, you know, It'll either all work out in three months or it won't. And I'll go back to Miami. And everything fell into place. I found a position that I loved. I found an apartment that I loved. I met my now husband. All of the things that I had dreamed of happening in Chicago all fell into place in those three months. So I loved it here and stayed, obviously. I worked for other companies for the first six years that I was out and then bought my practice, really put down roots, all of that. Interesting. Okay. So you were living in London. I did like a study abroad program. I really loved the city. I loved really living downtown and walking everywhere. Yeah. That's what kind of set to you like, I want to be in a place like this. Is that what kind of? Absolutely. Yeah. It was like the energy of the city, kind of the hustle and bustle of it, the access to really great arts programs, theater, music, all of those things that, yeah, we have it in Florida, but it's not every day, that's for sure. And it's not in as close proximity. So Florida, even Miami is very much like LA where everything's super spread out and it takes like hours to get anywhere. And I really wanted something that was like that Northern type of city where everything's really close. You can have access to the arts daily if you wanted to. And it's just a lot more convenient. I like that, Brittany. I like how you thought of your lifestyle first? Because we can think like, oh, middle of Texas is rural area where it's we're going to have amazing cash flow, new patients, all these things, right? We're no competition. But in your mind, you're like, I want to be where I want to be. And then you said (laughs) methodically, you looked at other cities. So what does that mean methodically? Like, what were you doing? I went and spent time there. I spent a couple of weeks in New York and I really liked the energy of the city, but it was a little too hectic for me. And it felt like people were working really hard just to survive. I had a friend of mine who was first year out dentist living in a one bedroom apartment with three roommates with those like false walls that they set up. And I took one look at that and I thought, no, (laughs) no, that's not for me. I wanted 
to work hard, but I wanted to be able to enjoy my life as well. And I think that's probably because I was older. I was almost 30 when I graduated. So I had been out in the workforce, gone back to dental school, and I knew what kind of life that I wanted. It wasn't necessarily more money. It was more balance. Can I ask, what does balance look like to you? It means having time to do the things that feed my energy. So having time to go to my yoga class, take a walk at sunset, go to the farmer's market on a Saturday. Little things that I probably wouldn't have had time to do if I was in New York because I would be working really long hours, weekends, things like that. And in Chicago, because it's a lot more affordable, I would be able to have that balance. My impression of the city of Chicago before I moved here was that if you work hard here, you can thrive. If you work hard in New York, you could just survive. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to thrive. I like that. So throughout the process where you decided, okay, this is where it's going to be, Chicago, and then the six years passed, did you feel at any moment you were losing balance? I did. I was working for a small corporate dental group. And, you know, when I was hired, I was told that I would be given the bad hours just for like the first year or two, and then it would get better. So I was working till 8 p.m. And I was also working Saturday and Sunday. So yeah, I said all that stuff about balance. And then <laughs> I got into the, like, the least amount of balance possible. However, the people that I worked with were a dream. I was working in a huge group, 15 general dentists. And I would say seven or eight of them were between the ages of 75 and 85. Oh. So they had been in practice a really long time. They had taught for Northwestern and they just wanted to pass on their knowledge to people. So they had built this practice back in the 60s and sold it to corporate, but stayed on for 12 years after selling because they just liked to be together. And I really loved being around them. So I stayed for them. And when all the restrictions happened during COVID, none of them were working, obviously. They were much, much older. And I saw what my life would be when they started to retire. And I realized that I was staying in an unbalanced setting just because I loved them so much. And I couldn't hold myself back from balance and the lifestyle and the life that I wanted. That's why I acquired this practice three months into a pandemic, which mm. most people would say was very risky, but it felt like the right move for me. Gotcha. So then most of them during the pandemic kind of just retired, I guess. Oh no, they didn't retire. They just put a pause. Oh. Most of them are still working. Yeah. Now they're like probably closer to 90, hey, a lot yeah. of them. Yeah. They don't do as much like heavy dentistry. I know a couple of them do more like sleep medicine, more like analysis type of stuff, but a couple of them still have really good hands and wow. that's incredible. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's a testament to our business of dentistry is that if you're doing something that you love with people that you love, you'll stay forever because mm -hmm. they don't want to leave. They're happy being there. That's nice. I like that. So then- yeah. What were some of the great things you learned from them or from the six years that you've worked at other practices? Or did you work at other practices or no, that was it? And I did. I worked at a couple of private practices, usually for like two years at a time, just learning from each private practice, how they run things, how they treat their team, how they run a new patient appointment, because it's so different from practice to practice, picking up little pearls along the way from those different private practices. And from corporate I learned the harder side of business, like running profit and loss statement, how to really evaluate how you're spending things because they weren't giving me any kind of input into this, but they were really transparent about like how they run their business, which I thought was a really great learning experience. And from working with those other dentists that had been in practice for so long, they each had almost carved out their own niche. So there was one that was really accomplished in occlusion and had been through all the Dawson courses. There was one that was one of the original lecturers for Lumineers. He was the one who introduced me to cosmetics. There were a couple who had built very small private practices separately and then joined. So I got to like pick their brain a little bit on things that they would do for their patients. So I would pick up all these little tidbits along the way from each person. One in particular, he mostly did dentures. And I don't do dentures at all. But he was very knowledgeable about investments, 401k, stock market type of stuff. And he basically set up my entire retirement plan for me. 
which I still use, which is so interesting, right? It's like I learned a lot of things about dentistry, but also a lot of life skills from them. That's nice. I like that. So he set up everything for like your retirement. Could we ask, like, what does that look like or no? It was based on the Gone Fishing portfolio. Have you ever heard about that book? No, I never heard. I think it maybe is 20 years old. He said he had set up his daughter's retirement plan based on that. And it had been 20 years and she could retire today and she was maybe 45. Really? Yeah. 20 year kind of plan. Gone fishing portfolio. Man, that's so nice. You went through that. Is there any specific systems from the practices that you've worked at, even the corporate ones, that you were like, man, I love this. I love what they're doing. I'm taking it. And I'm going to maybe make my own version of it or whatever. And then were there some that you just, I hate this kind of thing. Let's start with the negative. The corporate dental office not their doctors, but their other team members, they didn't make them feel valued. And they would let them go over like a salary increase of 50 cents or a dollar, which I just thought was so short sighted because you lose so much in experience and so much productivity just by losing one team member that you have to replace. And let's do now the flip side of it. In one of the private practices I worked in, it was almost like shared profit that they did with their entire team. So they had a minimum that they had to make every month to like cover expenses, bills, things like that. And above that, things were split. Everyone shared in that profitability of the practice and it made everybody really invested. It also made them feel really valued. Like, hey, if we're all busting our butts here, we're going to profit. We're not just busting our butts and getting exhausted and the doctor is taking all the money. So I really enjoyed that. And that's what I do with my team. Everybody has equity? I don't think you would call it equity because they don't own part of the business but they have profit sharing. Interesting. Okay. And then how big is your team? I have five people, including myself. So when you did the acquisition, did everybody like stay on, on the original team or? Originally, yes. I've had two people switch out since then. One moved away to Australia and the other one was offered a position with a startup, not in dentistry, that had a huge compensation package that she knew that I couldn't match. In both cases, I had really good relationships with them and they let me know a couple of months before this was happening. And my front desk actually trained the person who was replacing her for like a month and a half. Nice. Yeah. So that was great. So it worked out. So right now you have five team members originally completely fee for service. Was it fee for service like that before? It was completely fee for service and also focused on cosmetic. So if you've had other cosmetic people on here, you would know that when you acquire a cosmetic office, you're not really acquiring like a patient load, especially a single doctor cosmetic office. They're there for the doctor. They're there for their artistic skill. There was a small pool of patients that were there for cleanings, like regular dental work. But in general, you're kind of a startup on the cosmetic side because I'm having to invest in marketing, put myself out there and really build up that part of it. So that's what I've been doing for the last four years. And I was doing cosmetics in my other offices. So I had people referring from that, but it's totally different than running a cosmetic office. How so? When I'm just doing cosmetic and I happen to be at a corporate office, they're filling my schedule with crowns, fillings, extractions, things like that. I was doing maybe one cosmetic case a month. And if I'm running a cosmetic practice, we need more than that to pay the bills and everything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so you decided, because I know you said you're, some of the mentors or people in the past almost carved out their own niche, occlusion, dentures, cosmetics. Is this something you've always wanted to do or you kind of were just? Yeah, I've always been interested in it. And I think it might have to do with where I grew up in Miami. It's very beauty focused. And when I was in college, I really wanted to be a facial plastic surgeon. That's what I wanted to do. And then I looked into how much school that would be. And I thought, maybe no, (laughs) maybe let's find something a little shorter. (laughs) Also lifestyle, right? Lifestyle of a surgeon is you basically have no life until you're 40. And then I looked at a bunch of other things and I found dentistry and I found all the different things you could do in dentistry, cosmetics being one of them. Everything fell into place. I shadowed so much in dental before I even applied to school because I wanted to make sure that I was making the right decision. I think from my story earlier about how I moved to Chicago and how I last minute bought a dental practice, you would think I don't think things through, but 
I actually put a lot of work into like making sure that this was the right career option for me. I worked as a dental assistant for two years and I really spent time chair side making sure that I liked dentistry, not mm. just cosmetics, but that I enjoyed being in the dental setting. And I really did. I loved it. I like that. So you wore the hats of everybody to make sure not only that you understood it, but at the same time that you liked it. Yeah. I wanted to make sure that it would be the right thing for me. And I do still think it is. It's been 10 years that I've been working now and I really love what I do. Not just the cosmetic aspect. I think that for a social introvert like myself, it is the absolute perfect job because you do get to talk to people, but you're talking like one-on-one with a person for an hour at a time. It's never overwhelming, but it feeds that social aspect of you. And you get to create these like actual relationships with your patients over time. And that I really love about it. So Mm -hmm. I like the technical aspect. I love the cosmetic aspect. And I also really love the human aspect of it. I never heard of that. Social introvert. Like meeting a bunch of new people can be really overwhelming and you feel like you have to be on. And a lot of people love that. For me, it's a little exhausting getting to know a new person. But once I've gotten to know them, it is actually energizing to follow up and talk with them and ask how their vacation was and things like that. So it's almost like in large social settings, you get a little overwhelmed. Like if I was in sales having to pitch to groups of 15 all day, that wouldn't feed me as well. But doing like these one-on-one things, it's much more palatable to a social introvert. I like that. If we can, let's dive a little bit deeper inside your business. I know before we got on the call, you were mentioning how at the beginning of the year, you guys decide as a team, what days are we going to be off or what time Mm -hmm. are we going to have like our breaks from the year and stuff like that? Can you dive a little bit deeper into that? Like what's the thought process behind it? So I have a very small team. It's two assistants, a front desk and a social media person. For me, if one person's out, it throws us off completely. I learned early on that if we talk and we all kind of pitch in to figure out what our schedule is, it gives them a lot of control over their year. It also gives me advanced planning. I don't think every dentist would be able to do this. I don't have children. My husband and I are very flexible. So we know we always want to go on vacation for our anniversary. But other than that, we can go on vacation any other time of the year. I'm not really stuck to a school schedule. So If I sit down with my team and they say, oh, I really want to go out of town for my birthday, or I really want to go out of town for the 4th of July, that's totally fine. doesn't bother me at all. We'll block it out. We'll make sure that the office is closed and that way they can enjoy the time that they want. And there's not really like an approval process because there's a lot of back and forth. And I think other offices, it'll be maybe a month before, two weeks before, and a team member will come and say, oh, I need this day off. But in dentistry, we're booked out six months ahead. So two weeks ahead doesn't do much. Then we would have to call patients and reschedule them. And I think this way is a really good respect for people's time, my time, my team's time, and our patient's time as well. That way we can all plan in advance, patients included, and know that we can all count on each other to be where we said we're going to be. Does it ever happen, Brittany, where somebody's like, oh, I want to have this week off. And then another person, I want to have, because five team members is still quite a bit. So I want to have this week off too. Oh, but my kids have this time. You know what I mean? And then you kind of look at it and you're like, everybody's. That's why we kind of take it the whole year at a time, because then we can see, oh, back to back, you guys want to go out of town in October. That's not going to work because we won't be able to make our minimum. Because they're invested in it and because we profit share, they're as invested in us being able to make it all work just as much as I am. Come to think of it also, none of my team members have children yet. So none of us are tied to the school schedule. Yeah. So that probably keeps it a little bit easier. When I was working for larger offices, a handful of the team members would have kids and sometimes it would be harder for them because they are tied to the school schedule. Gotcha. Sounds like your team's like, extremely reasonable. They're like, hey, it's back to back. Let's not do that. Right. Instead of like, well, I have to do it my way. And then the other team members like, well, I want to do it my way too. Kind of a thing. You know what I mean? It's a team. Yeah. We're all working together. And I always say no one of us is more important than the other. We're each like the head of our function. I am the only doctor. My front desk is the only front desk. My assistants are the only ones who can do what they do. So they each feel really valued in what they do because they know I can't work without them. And they can't work without me. So I will jump in and help with sterilization. I'll help turn over a room. I'm not above that. 
just because I'm the doctor. We're all here to help each other. That's nice. I like that. You mentioned they'll look at the schedule and then they'll notice, oh, we're not reaching our minimum. What is that minimum? It's just based on what our expenses are. What would so, be the minimum for you guys? It is 54000 okay. So is that to break even for you or is that to... Yeah, that's to break even. Okay. Per month? Per month. I gotcha. Yes. Okay. With that in mind, you also mentioned one social media person and their job is just social media. Like, because I was looking at your website and everything and it's popping. Like you guys are doing Thanks. a lot of great stuff. And so I was wondering, what are you doing for marketing? Mostly socials and website. But I would say a lot of it is word of mouth. We do ask patients for referrals if there's someone that we really enjoy, which at this point, four years in, I really enjoy everybody that's with me. I took a couple of business classes in college. And one of the things that they recommended was doing a profile for your ideal patient. And not just one, doing like three or four of them because there's all different kinds of people, but you're almost like building a character for all of these people, like avatars for them. And then becoming involved in the things that they would be involved in. So you want to make sure it aligns with you, obviously. For me, I love health and wellness. So I joined this really wonderful wellness program by my house, this Eastern and Western medicine. It's expensive, but for me, it's worth it. And it also puts me in a community of like-minded people who are invested in their health, who can afford the kind of treatment that I do. And that's been a huge referral source for me. I also volunteer with the Junior League of Chicago and I have done for 10 years now. And it's all younger, fresh from college, that almost engaged getting married period where when they do get engaged or married, they usually want to whiten their teeth or straighten their smile, do something. That's another huge referral source for me. So I think community involvement, even more so than social media for me, has been my biggest marketing and referral source. Mm, okay. So going to these businesses or locations, where they're at, it's super smart that yeah. you go into health and wellness, you just become a part of it. That way it's not like you're just dropping off something and saying like, hey guys, we're here, we're partnering up, we're new down the street, here you go, right? And then they just forget about it. It's yeah. more like you're involved in their world. I mean, I get to reap the benefits of being extra healthy and getting to do my like yoga classes and my well-balanced food and my steam room and cold plunge every day. Oh man, that's a steam and cold plunge? Yeah. So it's a steam room with a cold plunge yeah. in it. So mm -hmm. when you're like in the cold plunge, there's still the steam around your head and I can oh. actually stay in a lot longer because like my head is still warm. Oh, But for dentistry, it's amazing. So at this wellness center that I go to, there is a physical therapist and an acupuncturist. And in dentistry, we always get like neck and back and shoulder problems. And I was seeing her for a shoulder problem and she suggested cold plunge. I've been cold plunging now for like two years, at least three times a week. And I haven't had shoulder pain come back. Really? Yeah. It's so good at decreasing inflammation and boosting energy. So I'll try to do it in the mornings if I can. Mm -hmm. But even if I have to do it in the evening, I'll just have to sit in the steam for a little bit longer to like get my body to calm down a bit. Yeah. I noticed with a uh, cold plunge, it was when we were in Ireland one time, I went and I didn't even need coffee anymore. Like it just no. felt like everything was all neurons were yeah. firing at like, you know what I mean? You were awake, you were mm -hmm. aware and it was nice. But okay. So then for your marketing though, since you're doing a lot of community involvement, I guess if you can, how much of your budget goes toward marketing? How do you decide that? And has it changed um, uh, as your practice grows? A consultant once told me if you're spending more than 10% of your income on marketing, then that's too much. I've tried other things for sure. I've tried things that are expensive. I've tried high-end magazines. Something that I kept on that the previous owner did, it's like almost billboards along our I'll stop. So the train system here. And so I basically continued with what the previous owner had done for the first year or two, just because I feel like 2020 is kind of a wash. It wasn't like as representative. So I kept through it 2021 as well and kept track of what people were coming from certain things that I was investing in. And I will say those billboards cost me over 20 grand a year and I didn't get one person. Really? Yes. Not mm -hmm. one. So that went. I did get a handful of people from the magazines, but not as much as you would expect. So I started just investing in my website and really high quality photography. 
I did all the social media myself for the first, I would say, three years until I had a really good book of how I wanted things to be as far as like brand voice, the look of everything, the timing of when I want everything to go out. And I have somebody that organizes it for me, but I still take all of the images and write most of the content and film all of the videos. And I just send them to somebody who kind of organizes it and plugs it in for things to go out at certain times. Because so right during the day, I'm in the office, I'm working. Mm-hmm. But it's important for somebody to physically be on platforms when things are going out. So you're the one who does the recording and do you take the pictures and stuff like that or not? Some stuff. For pictures of me, I have a photographer that I'll do a photo shoot with once a year, every other year. For that, I had like hair, makeup, stylist, and a photographer. I took a ton of images at that two-day shoot that I was able to use for a year. But that was images for my dental practice and for my injectables business, which has different branding. So you have to be really organized to do something like that. And I love those images. But I'm finding that what performs better are things that are a little bit more candid. So that's why I backed off. I'm doing like every other year taking those images because it's great to have stock photos from those. But it performs better to have things that are a little more genuine, things that show people who you are. And I've gone a lot more toward reels and like educational type of stuff in the last six months. The candid ones, is that like you just, you grab your husband's phone or whatever and you're like, oh, you took this picture of me kind of a thing. And then you just. Let's see. A few weeks ago, we were like on a longer car ride trying to get to a dinner. And he was asking me some like random questions about someone's veneer console. I'm like, you know what? Take the phone, record me, ask me your questions. And so he did. And then I cut it into a couple of reels and use that as content. During my workday, if we're slammed, I'll have my office manager come and take images or take stories while we're working. So it's everybody's involved, but everybody in the team knows that we have to be collecting content all the time. I do a lot of it in my off time as well. Mm -hmm, Like admin time kind of a thing. Yeah. So then How did you know how you wanted things to be and the timing of the post or anything like that? And how did you get so specific with that to where you created it? I did go through worksheets and like developing brand voice, brand personality, like a lookbook, things like that. And because I'm a solo practitioner in a private practice, I am the brand. Mm -hmm. Like people are coming to see me. So it was easy for me to just put into words who I am. It did take some introspection. It's almost like retreat time, which is what I'm doing right now. Every so often, I redo this because as a person, we're always evolving and changing. And our brand should reflect that, especially if your brand is a personal brand like a cosmetic dentist would be. So going through these worksheets, nailing down those things, because I did a lot of my own content or almost all of my own content for those first three years, I was able to compile a lookbook And every six months or so, when I reevaluate things, I just make little changes. I'll change the color scheme a little bit, not too much because all of our branding and logos are pretty set, but I'll change like how I want things to be lit. A lot of what I'm doing is reels now. So brand voice is my voice, Mm -hmm. which makes it a lot easier. (laughs) Timing, that was all trial and error. All trial and error, watching insights on... YouTube, on LinkedIn, on Instagram, you can get insights from anything. It just takes a lot of time, a lot of posts so that you can see what performs and following what performs. Okay. I like that. Where can we get these worksheets or where did you get them? Oh, Google. (laughs) Just type in branding (laughs) worksheets? Yeah. So I love YouTube. I'll go on YouTube and watch things almost like they're meant for like content creators, not dentists. Dentistry is way behind the times on everything. Content creators are where it's at. And they love to teach each other. So there's like paid classes that you can take. There are just like free intro YouTube videos. So like I watched a bunch of YouTube videos on branding and personal branding. And through that, I found out about like brand voice, brand personality, motto, almost imagery, things like that. And then I went on Google and said, okay, where's a worksheet on developing your brand voice? Like what questions should I like introspectively ask myself to develop this? Or sometimes they'll have like a bunch of descriptive words and you just like circle the ones that pop out to you or feel natural to you. And from that, you can extrapolate brand personality. There's so much information out there and a Mm. lot of it is free. It's just really time intensive. But I really do think that time is very well spent, especially if you're in your first 
year of practice, five years of practice, you want to spend the time to nail this down because it makes everything so much easier in the long run. And it makes it easy to pass off to a team member because you're giving them a very clear vision for how you want things to go. And there's a lot less back and forth then. Okay. So then yeah. one of the last questions I wanted to ask you, Brittany, is what's one piece of advice you'd give to other practice owners or potential practice owners about getting the most out of their marketing efforts right now? Evaluate what you're actually getting from it. I think we all want to be all the things. We want to put so much content out there on all these different platforms. Not every platform is going to be right for your practice. So I think start out by doing everything, which is exhausting, but evaluate if anybody's coming from that. Evaluate click-throughs to your website. Evaluate whether your website is converting. And don't be afraid to change it. In this beginning stages, it's a lot easier to change than 10 years down the road when everyone knows your branding, knows your voice, or people are confused about what you do. It's easier to make these changes rapid fire and kind of roll with the punches in the beginning until you really hone in on your target market, what platforms are actually serving those people and which ones are actually converting because that's the most important one, right? It's great if everybody's watching your videos, but if they're not converting, then we need to keep looking for something else. Can I ask, what were those platforms for you right now? Google. My website was a big one and I rank pretty highly when you search for like specific terms on Google. Instagram is a good converter for me. And surprisingly, LinkedIn. Patients coming through LinkedIn? Yes. Wow. <laughs> yes, that phase. My dad actually told me to do this years ago. And I was like, what do you know? <laughs> <laughs> Which is so stupid because I need to tell him he was right. I was wrong. He told me to do this years ago. I get so many people from LinkedIn. My dad's not in medicine. He's in like a totally different industry. I was like, I don't think anyone is going to come to me from LinkedIn. Surely enough, people come to me from LinkedIn. Wow. And it's like really great patients that are easy to work on. I don't know how to describe that, but we all know there's some people that are just really laid back. They're like, do whatever you think is necessary. They're just easy. I get my easiest people from LinkedIn. That strategy there, is it the same as like Instagram or no? It's a no. little bit. Yeah, it's different. And that was a whole other YouTube rabbit hole. My husband is an understanding man because I will play these YouTube videos one after another on our TV like at night and he just goes with it. It's, yeah, it's I mean, he owns his own business too. So some of this stuff applies to him, but it's like a dance company. So it, he's not on LinkedIn for that. I'll spend like hours every night. And that's kind of just how it is in the first five years of practice. You're building something. And if you want it to be great, it has to be your whole life. And not in a bad way. You just have to love it that much that you want to be learning and doing better and making sure everybody knows about you. Yeah. Wonderful, Brittany. Thank you so much for being with us. It's been a pleasure. But before we say goodbye, can you tell our listeners where they can find you? Yes, you can find me on Instagram at Dr. Brittany Dickinson. Nice. So that's going to be in the show notes below, along with any of the links, her website as well. And at the same time, Brittany, thank you so much for being with us. It's been a pleasure and we'll hear from you soon. Thank you for having me.